what did we do last time? Right, last time, let's recall. Um, what does it mean for a function to be continuous? F is continuous at uh, some point C if, so this was our definition of continuity, let's just remember that. What does continuity mean? You're continuous at C if, um, I should know this by now, tell me again. Rohan. Right, so the limit of f of x, first of all, exists, which means uh, exists. So this, by the way, i.e., i.e., the left limit, the limit as x goes to c, which one's left? From the left, from the right, from the right, uh, exists. And the limit as x goes to c, from the left exists and the two agree, they agree, okay? So that's one definition. This is the definition of a limit existing. I'm reminding you, I'm reminding you of one definition inside your, the reminder of another definition. Question? Um, Hari? Yeah. Uh, and Yes, continue, Hari. Exactly, exactly. All right, so so as as Hari and uh, Rohit, as Hari and Rohit told, uh, reminded us, a limit exists if the left limit and right limit exist and they agree. So you're coming in from the left, you're coming in from the right, you're coming into the same value, and the value exists and the value agrees with the limit. So every single, everything agrees with everything else. You can come into a function from a left. You can come into a function to a point along a function, along the graph of a function from the left, from the right, or you can take that value. All three of those have to agree. And that's what it means to move your pen smoothly through that point without picking up the pen. Okay, that's continuity. Uh, we did the intermediate value theorem, I, uh, IVT. IVT, this is the intermediate, intermediate value theorem. Value theorem, what does it say? Um, tell me again. Uh, Third. If, uh, and if f of e and f of e are opposite signs, then not opposite signs, but f, f of e and f of e. f of c exists, where c is in the interval a and b, and f, uh, between f of e is in the interval f of e and f of e. Great. So let me say that back to you again. Um, this would be a really good question on the midterm. State the intermediate value theorem precisely. That would be a really good question for the midterm. Do you understand what the, the statements of the theorems are? Do you understand what the definitions are? These are the kinds of things that uh, definitely could be on the exam. And believe it or not, even though you understand exactly what, what it means, it's hard to say, which means it's even harder to write. So it takes practice to write these things. That's why in workshop, we have you writing things out. Communicating mathematics is as important if not more so, then is as equally important, I would say, not more so, than being able to compute. So computing and getting to the right answer is absolutely essential. That's what we, we do. But you should also understand what it is you're computing. And in order to explain to someone else what it is you're computing, you have to be able to communicate. So let's practice writing what the intermediate value theorem says. It says if uh, f is continuous, f is continuous on a whole interval, on a, B, on a closed interval, A, B, that is, it's continuous for every point inside the interval, okay? And the left interval, okay, it's, it's a slightly, uh, this is a slightly technical definition, actually. Let, let me come back to, to that. We have an intuitive understanding of what that means. So our picture is 
uh, we have some value A, we have some value B, we have some interval and F starts here and F ends here, wherever that happens to be. And by the way, the values of F don't need to remain in, within uh, the value of F of A and F of B. So here's F of A and F of B. So we don't know, we can't tell the application uh, about this. The, uh, the good application of the intermediate value theorem is for finding zeros, among other things. There'll be other applications that we'll see later. But anyway, if F is continuous on an interval, then for all values, I won't use the shorthand right now, for all, which I would write as for all, I'll remind you of the shorthand, for all values of Y in uh, between F of A and F of B. I don't know which one's bigger. So between, between F of A and F of B, for any value of Y between F of A and F of B, wherever, wherever those might lie, for any possible value of Y, to get from F of A to F of B, somewhere I have to cross Y for any value of Y. If the function is continuous, to draw it, I have to, I have to pass through. Uh, there has to be some place where, where we pass through. So there's some value. That's the picture, but let's write it in words for all. So again, if F is continuous on an interval A to B, then for all values of Y between F of A and F of B, there exists, there exists, which we would abbreviate with this symbol, a value C in the interval AB, there exists some value C in the interval AB such that, such that F of C is equal to Y. So that the function takes the value Y at X equals C, okay? That's the intermediate value. Here. So again, practice, practice communicating that because it's a, it's a slightly complicated uh, concept. Uh, a couple of subtleties on it. Um, why do I insist here that I have a closed interval? Could it be a not closed interval? Could it be an open interval? Why not? Um, Zane, thank you. Yeah, if it's only continuous on an open interval, this is this is slightly subtle, but uh, think of the function um, f of x is equal to one over x on zero one, on uh, zero one, on the open interval zero one. Here's zero, here's one. This function is continuous on the open interval, right? For any, for any value uh, in this open interval, I, I can draw it nearby that value without raising my pen. Everybody knows what one over X is this uh, hyperbola looking thing, right? But first of all, there is no value of F of zero. Uh, uh, is continuous on zero one, but uh, F of zero doesn't exist, does not exist. Okay, so that's one thing that could go wrong. So, so it, the, the function needs to be continuous, starting with a closed interval and then ending with a closed, and ending with a with a, a value. So I, I need to start at a value. I need to end at an actual value. Okay. Um, the slightly subtle thing that I said is, uh, what does it mean to be continuous on a closed interval? Well, what does continuity mean at the point A? I don't have a left limit. Yes, I don't, left. I don't have a left limit. I only have a right limit and the value. And at B, I only have a left limit and the value, right? So if we're talking about continuity, uh, this, this again, this is a little more subtle and uh, not the kind of, this is like pedantics. But those of you that are uh, interested in knowing these things, just, just FYI, uh, for any point in the middle, the notion of continuity is that, well, you can cross from both sides, from, the, from left to right without picking up the pen. But if you're at the boundary of where a function is defined, then continuity is a one-sided continuity. You can go from below to the value or 
from above to the value. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a, a slightly subtle point. Um, uh, don't tell me. Annabelle. Yeah. And then Peter. So at those endpoints, it is we we will change the definition of continuity what continuity means when the domain starts at that value and goes forward or st stops at that value so continuity at a point so continuous at a point is two-sided continuity and then con continuity at the boundary of the domain is just a one-sided continuity and that the value agrees with the limit should i write that down okay let me write that down so this is a subtle aside, not the kind of thing that I want you focusing on or worrying about. Um, if, if the domain of F is some region A and B, we say that F is continuous Let's say which side you want, A or B, which endpoint? A is continuous at X. Did you say A? Did you say B? And I, no, I said A. You said A. Okay, at, at X equals A. If we don't have a limit from the underside, so we'll just say, it, you see, continuity is about drawing the curve. But if you start the curve there, then I can't go backwards. So I just, okay, forget about that backwards part. If the limit as X goes to A from above of F of X exists, and and is equal to the value and agrees with f of a itself okay so that's a one-sided limit one-sided continuity ah okay good well so it's a subtle aside but just uh, good you had some practice with it yeah. peter so and then there's a there's another definition which is what does it mean to be uh continuous at the point b which would be approaching from the left but if i don't have a left to approach from that's okay i'll still call it a one-sided continuous does that make sense fatima is that a hand no other questions all right this is again a subtlety that I'm not trying to, uh, well, I spent more time apologizing for the subtlety than just telling you what it is and, and moving on. Um, okay, and of course the, the use, what's the use? A nice application of the intermediate value theorem is for, see, finding zeros. Yeah, finding zeros, finding zeros. If a continuous function crosses zero, well, starts out negative, winds up, it changes sign. If a continuous function changes sign, changes sign, it must cross, it must cross zero. Okay. So that's a little aside about the intermediate value theorem. We talked about the continuous extension of a function. I'm just reminding you from last time. What was the continuous extension? Um, Nimmer. So you have a discontinuous function. Yep. Extension would be on the piecewise function at the point where the uh, function is defined. Great. If f, um, how should we say this? Well, let's just say if the limit of f exists. Uh, okay, fine. If f is undefined or or not defined is let's just say not continuous, not continuous at uh, some point x equals c, but the limit exists, exists. Nah, let me not try to cram it into here. Oh, I didn't have to erase it, right? I, I have a fancy thing, undo, grab, grab this stuff and move it over. Ah, beauty. Can't do that on Blackboard. Sorry, I'm enjoying playing with this toy. Um, if, uh, okay, so here's a concept of continuous extension, as Nimmer said, if F is continuous at a point, is not continuous at a point, but the limit exists, 
Let's just see what it might say. But the limit as x goes to c if f of x exists, then we can define the continuous extension which would be piecewise exactly as Nimer said it'll be f of x if x is not equal to c and the limit whatever that limiting value is well, let's let's give it a name exists and is equal to L or something so that you don't get confused by this formula. It's just a number. You're just plugging a hole if X is equal to C. Okay, so the picture to have in your mind, that's the picture I can put here. Either the function just doesn't exist at that point, but the left and right limits agree, or the function does exist at that point, but it's not continuous because it's, it's not taking the right value. In either of these cases, Either it's undefined or the, the value doesn't agree with the left and right limit, but the left and right limits exist. Then we can extend the function by just saying, well, the limit was some value L, so plug the hole by stick by changing the definition of the function. Okay. And we use that, we used uh, this idea and the squeeze theorem, uh, squeeze theorem. Uh, I saw that some people call it the uh, Drunkard and two policemen theorem. The, the two policemen are, are sort of from either side approaching. Uh, I don't know. Mathematicians like drunken random walks or something. So the squeeze theorem: if you have if you have uh, two people helping a drunk get somewhere, then uh, there's a function above, a function below, and somewhere in between. Whatever. Squeeze theorem, sandwich theorem, whatever you want to call it. We use the squeeze theorem to give a uh, continuous extension continuous extension to the function sine x over x. So let's call this g of x. This is defined as long as you to as long as you're not dividing by zero. And if you are, we computed the limit of what happens when x goes to zero and we found that the limit was that's sine of one over x. Sine of one over x does this. Sine of x over x did one. Yeah, we, sh we showed that the limit was one. It was a complicated, slightly complicated proof. I'm not expecting you to be able to reproduce that proof, but we showed that the, uh, the limit as, is one as x goes to zero. And now we can just plug that, plug that value um, to make sine x over x a nice function, okay? Just like you would see if you graphed it in dozens. Good. All right. That was all review about uh, limits and continuity, squeeze theorem, intermediate value theorem. Uh, what we need to add to our understanding of limits is limits at infinity. So let's talk about asymptotes. Limits at infinity are called asymptotes. I mean, if they exist. Okay. So let's talk about limits at infinity. Limits at infinity. So instead of saying a limit at x equals c as opposed to as opposed to at x equals c. Well, if c is infinity, I can't say at at x equals infinity. So instead we say as limits at infinity really means um, really what we say is uh, the limit as x goes to infinity as x approaches infinity. Okay, let's try some examples. Example, um, what is the limit of one over x as x goes to infinity? Other than uh, Raga, uh, hold on. Zero. Zero, why? Yeah, you take a giant number and you take one over that giant number you're gonna get closer and closer to a tiny number. You'll get closer and closer to Z, okay? So that's like taking the graph of one over X. So if I graph Y equals one over X, okay? And then I'm asking what happens out here, out here, out there, as you get farther and farther out, you'll see that the, the graph is getting closer and closer to Z. That's the kind of thing. So again, it's a very simple concept. Just wanna 
it's a very simple concept that can be uh well let's let's see some examples before we decide whether it's simple or not all right let's do another example here's another example what's the limit as x goes to infinity of x Nimmer. well i want something on the other side that doesn't include the dummy variable x X is just a dummy variable. Like we could said T or theta or whatever. Shreya? Infinity. infinity, beautiful. You were gonna say the right thing. Yeah, so just like, just like uh, one over X, the limit of one over X at zero is infinity. The limit doesn't exist. That's not an, ex infinity is not a real number, but we can still say that, the, that this value grows without bound in the same way the function Y equals X as x gets farther and farther out, grows without bound. Okay? Simple? Yeah. Good. Raga. So we'll write that the limit equals infinity, but remember that infinity is not a real number, so this is not a, an existing limit. So this is not uh, an existing, not a real number, not a real limit. That's probably... So if I, if someone were to ask, does the limit of X as X goes to infinity exist? The answer is no. Let me write that down. Let me write that down. The limit of F of X equals X as X goes to infinity does not exist, does not exist. It's larger than any real number. So, but which we write, which we write as the limit as X goes to infinity of X is infinity. So anytime a limit is equal to infinity, that's not, that doesn't mean the limit exists. It means the limit grows to that bound. Let's contrast that with, here's another example. What's the limit of sine of X as X goes to infinity? Um, Genesis. Good guess. Is it infinity? Okay, so sine of x, remember what the graph of sine is doing. It's doing this. So as x goes out to infinity, does it get larger than any uh, real number? And it, it just keeps oscillating. So what's the limit? Does not exist. There is no limit. Right, there is no limit. It's just it keeps moving around. It's not getting large. Getting large would also not be an existing limit, but at least it'd be an infinite limit. Here, it's just moving around. Generally, um, hold that thought for one second. The question was: Does any oscillating function not have a limit? Not necessarily. I'll show you in a second. So this, so this limit does not exist. The limit of sine of x simply there's no there's no other symbol other than well, do I say equals does not exist? That's not English. Uh, does not exist. Does not exist. Okay. Jenanine, to your question, what about um, what about sine of x over x? Here's another example. Sine x over x, which we studied at one, but what happens at infinity? So let's look at the limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x over x. So this is an oscillating function. It's oscillating like sine. We know that near one, it takes the value one. Other than Raga? Other than how long? Other than Annabelle? Uh, tell me your name. Ethan. Why do you say that? Yes, exactly. Sine only, only varies between minus one and one. So it's a small, it's a, it's a bounded function but you're dividing by larger and larger values. So even though it's oscillating, it's gonna oscillate. Those oscillations will be bounded by uh, one over X and, and uh, negative one over X. So here's one over X and this is negative one over X. Okay, so whatever the value of sine is doing, it will be oscillating, but those oscillations are getting smaller and smaller. And so this limit is indeed zero. Okay, 
So the reason this limit doesn't exist is that the limit isn't, uh, the, the values aren't approaching anything. They're just, they just keep going back and forth and back and forth. Does that make sense? Jenny? Should we see this? Let's, let's see this. I think this is a good thing to look at. Any questions before I switch over to Desmos and we look at some pictures? Okay, let's do a little bit of this. Okay, so here's how you can tell, and maybe I should have done this from the beginning. How do you tell, okay, here's the graph of sine x, right? As I zoom out, uh, isn't there a way for me to zoom the x-axis? No, no, there we go. That's, that's what I want. Oh, it's too oscillatory, so I can't grab just the x-axis. Just the x-axis, please, please. Yeah, there we go, right? This is what I mean by the limit at infinity. As I zoom out, I'm not getting any one value. It keeps jumping up and down and up and down and up and down. As opposed to, now let's uh, reset. As opposed to the function sine x over x, sine of x divided by x, there's our limit that we've talked about many times and our continuous extension. But what happens as you move farther and farther out? It's getting closer and closer to zero. It's getting flatter and flatter. And in fact, it's bounded, what I said before, is it's bounded by the function one over X because sine is bounded above by one and below by negative one. Um, so if I do negative one divided by X, you see, uh, I don't have a pointer here, right? So here's the values of one over X and negative one over X. One over X is this hyperbola, negative one over X is, is the green hyperbola. And the sine function is oscillating between these two. So this is a kind of squeeze theorem at infinity. Does that make sense? This, uh, it's a squeeze theorem at infinity because the function one over X is, bound, is going to zero. The function negative one over X is also going to zero as X goes to infinity. And as I zoom more and more out, please, as I zoom more and more out, the values are going to zero. They're not, they're not they are oscillating, but the oscillations are smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? Uh, Shreya. <laughs> Say it one more time. In the squeeze theorem. Yeah, yeah, let's write that down. Let's write that down. Um, so uh, one way to see this, so this is, this going to zero is a kind of squeeze theorem at infinity. Squeeze theorem at infinity. Um, the limit as x goes to infinity of one over x is indeed zero, just like we saw. That's this, uh, let me play with colors. That's this limit. This limit is zero. There's another limit, which is the limit as x goes to infinity of minus one over x, which is also zero. And because sine and because sine, um, sine of x is bounded by one and negative one. So sine of x over x is bounded by one and negative one as x goes to infinity. Okay, so I mean, it's just for any positive value, that's, that's true. For any positive, this is for x positive. And so this goes to zero, this goes to zero, this thing as this goes to zero as X goes to infinity, as X goes to infinity. So this thing is squeezed and has no other choice but to go to zero, even though it does so in an oscillatory way. Okay. How many are lost? How many are bored? This makes complete sense and we're going too slow. Yeah, I, I realize that many of you are bored. It's, it's a slightly, Boring topic until we get to some of the things we're about to get to. Okay. Um, it, it's kind of obvious once you're used to limits until you get to some non-obvious things. So let's get to some non-obvious things. All right, uh, example. What is the limit as X goes to infinity of X divided by X plus one? Okay, uh, who said that? Somebody said it. Uh, Dan, Dan, you said it. No, I didn't say it. It, it would be one 
Why do you say that? Because, um, like, as you're approaching like infinity, which is like so big, like that one doesn't make a difference to the denominator. So it would just be one. Okay. Do you guys, did you guys ever uh, have these fights in school about 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, whether that's equal to one or not? Right? Like, point, what's this number? This number. And all the way repeated. Some of you would say this is equal to one, and some of you would say it's not. Is that true? How many would say it's equal to one? Okay, how many say it's not equal to one? Okay, half and half. All right, very, very interesting. Well, the, the, okay, this is getting to some, something rather subtle about the construction of the real numbers, which we're not gonna go to it, Dedekind cuts and Cauchy sequences and things like this. Um, you're kind of both right in that, well, no, the, the limit is one, but I didn't specify this. What's really, you're both right because some of you are looking at these numbers and these numbers for any finite amount is not equal to one, but there's this dot, dot, dot there and all of the mysteries hidden in that dot, dot, dot. What's really going on is that what, th think about this when X is, um, let's take when X is 99. Let's look at this quotient when X is 99. What is x over x plus one? 99 over 100, 99 over 100, that's 0 0.99. Okay, what about when x is 999? This thing is equal to 0 0.999, 0 0.999, right? And so as x gets larger and larger and larger, at least on these values, but on any value, it's exactly what, what Dan said, in the limits, in the limits, in the limits, uh, the value approaches, the value approaches one, okay? This ratio does approach one, and that's what's being hidden in this dot, dot, dot. So that's why you had the argument in grade school about whether it is or isn't equal, okay? Because we didn't really have a, notion, a nice notion of limits. We don't really have a nice notion of the real numbers yet. And you guys won't get to it until uh, 311, maybe 411. Um, it, it turns out it's something subtle. You didn't think the number line was subtle, but it is. But anyway, we're not, we're not gonna talk about that. Um, okay, so in the limit, the value does approach one and it's exactly what your intuition says. And if you look at a picture, uh, let's look at a picture. We don't need to look at every picture, but just for one more picture, what was it X over? X over X plus one, but X plus one. All right, so here's the function. It's gonna have a problem when X is equal to negative one. So at negative one, we have this vertical asymptote. And other than that vertical asymptote, look at what we're doing. We're just approaching one, getting closer and closer and closer to one as we go to the right. Closer and closer. Now it's 0 0.99 and, and so on. You see the, the, the y value? So the y value is getting closer and closer to one. Peter. I was going to ask a question that was just out. Tell me what the question was because other people might be confused about the thing. I was going to say, when did you technically say that the vertical shift got worse than I thought about it? Well, um, it is a shift. It, it is a kind of shift. Uh, should we talk about that? Let, let, let me say, in a, so, so here's one way to think of it as a shift. To, to Peter's point, another way to think about this, whoops, another way to think about this is to write what x over x plus one, if I divide top and bottom, so let me multiply top and bottom by one over x. Okay, so I multiply the top by one over x, I multiply the bottom by one over x. The, the top I, in the numerator, I get one. In the denominator, I get yeah, if I, if I foil, not foil, what is it? Distribute this out, I get one plus one over X. And so that's the sense in which you're taking one over X, you're shifting it, well, and then you're inverting it. I don't know, maybe that's not a, a great example, but the fact is this one over X is what's going to zero. We already know that one over X goes to zero. And now we're doing nice continuous things. We're adding one, we're dividing, we're not dividing by zero, we're dividing by something near one. So that's another way to see that this limit approaches one. 
if, if this one component is going to zero, then we're going to one over one. Does that make sense? Let's do exactly that same thing. Uh, here's another example. What's the limit of five X squared minus three X plus 17 divided by seven uh, plus three X minus four X squared, the limit as X goes to infinity. I told you it gets subtle, uh, but it's not that subtle, all right. Okay, you, uh, you, uh, that's correct. Give people a chance to think about it for one second. Let them struggle with it. How many people know the answer? Raghav knows the answer. Okay, so half of you know the answer. Half who don't, tell me what you're thinking. How many people don't know the answer? Oh, no, no, everyone will admit that they know the answer, but no one will admit that they don't. Thank you. Uh, you're, there's a lot of other people that don't. Uh, tell me your name again. Nirvan. So what are you thinking? How can you figure this thing out, right? It's like, this is a complicated function. I don't know what the graph is. It's got a quadratic on top, a quadratic on bottom. Let's divide, divide what? If we divide, see that the, the leading order of this, the largest, the thing that's gonna get biggest, the fastest is this X squared on top. Why do I call it a quadratic? Exactly because it has an X squared in it, as opposed to an X cubed, I'd call that a cubic. Or an X to the fourth, I'd call that a quarter, right? Whatever is the, the thing that's gonna blow up the fastest ad infinity, ad infinity. So here I have a, a X squared and there I have an X squared. That suggests that I should divide top and bottom by, go ahead. Um, you, you're saying co coefficient is this number five. The coefficients are five and negative three and 17. You're saying, you're saying just look at the coefficient of the leading term. Yes, Let's, that, that will be the answer. That's how Hari knew it immediately. Um, but before we get to the point where we do know, know it immediately, how would we figure it out if we didn't know to look for the coefficient of the leading term? If you divide the top and bottom, if you take the top and bottom and you divide by X squared, Y X squared, that's the leading order, exactly. We would get the limit as X goes to infinity of, now I have a five minus three over X plus 17 over X squared, all over seven over X squared, three over X, minus four, and all of these bits, all of these bits are going to zero. This is going to zero, this is going to zero, this is going to zero. And so in the limit, I'm gonna get negative five fourths. Okay, and if you're Hari, you would just see that right from the beginning, here's my, my negative four, those are the leading orders done. Anyway. Exactly. So this is, uh, th that's exactly, uh, did I not say the word horizontal asymptote anywhere? I have not. Good. Okay. So, so this is what's called, so let's get, get some terminology, negative five fourths, or what's the line negative five fourths? Is it an X equals something or a Y equals something? Y equals something. So the line Y equals five fourths is, um, so this is the, the equation of a line. Let me be, uh, I would never say all of these words, but I'm writing them now. The equation of a line, which is a horizontal, as opposed to vertical asymptote. We're used to vertical asymptotes, functions blowing up or approaching infinity or from one side infinity, from another side negative infinity. Now we have a, horizontal asymptote, okay? Should we see what this thing looks like in real life? Before we do that, one more time, tell me your name. Oh, Alyssa. Alyssa. Why, you divide by Why did I divide by X squared? I saw that there's an X squared term, an X and a constant. 
So of those, which is the one that's going to grow the fastest? If you were, if X is a thousand, well, this is still, this is still 17. This is never changing from 17. It's just going to stay 17 its whole life. This is going to turn into 3000. This is five times a thousand squared. A thousand squared is a thousand times a thousand. Sorry to call on you. It, it, it gets, math is really easy when someone, like everybody else knows the answer, but the one person's being asked the answer. That's what's uh, super hard. It's like when I call someone to the blackboard, uh, my, my working intelligence is inversely proportional to the distance to the blackboard. The second I get near a blackboard, I can't see things that are, that are like blatantly obvious to someone who's a foot away. So a thousand times a thousand, a million, a million. So this is five, five times a million. So this is 3000, but this is a million. Okay, so already when X is a thousand, this term is dominating everything else that's going on. So the X squared term is the leading term here, but here I hid the X squared term. I didn't give them to you in, in the order uh, of degree. I gave them in the other order, but the leading term is still X squared. It doesn't matter what order I write them. X, the X, there's an X squared here, there's an X squared there. Okay, does, does that make sense? Did I answer your question why I divided by X squared? Because oh, talking about like, when you get after like this, the this this yeah that okay great so once we divided by x squared we got this this expression and this is a limit as x goes to infinity so three over x three it's three divided by a thousand three divided by a million three divided by a billion that's going to zero so i can just uh i can just say this is going to zero this is going to zero even faster but it doesn't matter so this is going to zero, this is going to zero. What's zero plus zero plus negative four is negative four. That, that's what I have in the denominator. That's what's happening to the denominator. What's happening to the numerator is five minus something going to zero plus something else going to zero. Does that make sense? So I, I recognize these things as not contributing anything to the limit. And then I have a five on top and a four on bottom with a, with a minus. Sign. Does that make sense? Thank you for clarifying that. I, I guarantee you helped 10 people in this room. If it's a limit at infinity, then the leading terms will be the ones that give you uh, the asymptotic behavior. Uh, let's do a couple more examples. Oh, before we do more examples, let's just see what this one actually looks like. 5x squared minus 3x plus 17. Someone's going to have to tell me this. 7 plus 3x minus 4x squared. Okay. The numerator is 5 x squared minus 3x plus 17 divided by 7 plus 3x, thank you, minus 4x squared. OK, and we were zoomed all the way out. So look, it's got a crazy graph, right? The graph of this thing is not something that I would ask you to uh, write down just yet. Soon we'll get some more techniques from uh, differential calculus that will let us draw these things in, in quite some uh, detail. But I'm interested in the behavior as we go out to infinity. And as you can see, as we go out to infinity, we're, we're getting closer and closer to, do you see this negative 1.25? That's exactly our negative 5 fourths as we go farther and farther out in X. So the limit is uh, when I pull the, the axes over, and I'm trying to understand what's going on here. So now it's just negative 0.125. No matter what X is, it's uh, getting close and closer to negative five fourths. Okay, does that make sense? Well, zoom in a little. Uh, yeah, you mean go back, go back into this view? Can you see it? Yeah, okay. All right. Um, fine. Let's do, let's do a little quiz. Let's do a quiz. Here's a, our quiz prompt. As usual, write your name, uh, net ID, quiz, what's the limit as X goes to minus infinity, of three X squared minus seven x cubed plus five 
divided by um, 4x minus 3x squared plus 12x cubed. Uh, absolute value. Ooh, now I'm really messing with you. Okay, here's the quiz problem. Find out the limit as x goes to minus infinity. Not plus infinity, but minus infinity. Same difference, right? Same thing of 3x squared minus 7x cubed plus 5 divided by uh, the absolute value of 4x minus 3x squared plus 12x cubed. Take one minute and see if you can figure out what in the world this limit will be. Take a good five minutes. And as usual, raise your hand if you need a hint. If you're totally stuck and you don't even know where to start. Okay, name it. Totally stuck. Okay. Um, the first thing we did when we did the previous question was we looked for a leading order. Do you see a leading order in the numerator? What is it? It's the x cubed term, exactly. It comes with a negative seven, but it's the x cubed that I'm focusing on. How about on the bottom? There's another x cubed. So what could we do to the top and bottom? Let's start with that. Got it? Okay. Yeah. Tell me your name, I'm sorry. McKeon. You'll tell me after. Yeah. I'm going down. Well, it does affect it a little bit. So does the absolute value. So we're going to, we'll have to think about what's going on. But to start, we can do our usual uh, dividing things by x cubed, as Neymar suggested. I saw another hand over here somewhere. Ari, you got something? No. no. You have the answer? Yeah. Okay. Any other, anybody else need a hint? Jenny. It doesn't change that, that how we divide it by, in this case, it would be one over x cubed. Well, then we have to think for a minute. Then we have to think. What's that? You're saying write the bottom as a square root? Oh, we're gonna we're gonna get the square roots in a second. Yep. yep. I, I got a I got a whole bunch of them. We're we're doing all all these uh, different weird asymptotes. How many have the answer? Still see some people working. I'm going to give you another minute, Shreya. Um, uh, maybe, maybe. All right, sorry. Uh, no, it's it's pretty close. Okay. It's this this part is good, and then how did you get from there to there? This is x squared over x cubed. <laughs> okay, we want to try it all together? Ready? All right, let's do it all together. So, uh, who said? Nimmer said, let's divide by x cubed. Whoops. 
let me do this in uh, whatever this is, pink. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by one over x cubed. Okay, if you thought to do that, give yourself a point. So what are we going to get? This is the limit as x goes to minus infinity. Um, and I, I'm dividing by this x cubed. I bring the x cubed inside. So uh, what do I get? 3 over x, right? If I take this x cubed and I multiply by 3x squared, that's 3 over x minus 7. That looks good. Plus 5 divided by, now what happens to this x cubed when I bring it, can I bring an x cubed inside the absolute value? I'm sorry, five over x, thank you. Five, five over x cubed. Anyone can make mistakes, okay? Anyone. Um, okay, so this is the absolute value of four over x minus three, uh, 4 over x squared minus 3 over uh, x plus 12. I saw a lot of this. Is it right or isn't it right? No. Why or why not? You have it, but you know it's wrong. You know it's wrong just because I'm because I'm asking. No, because like at the absolute value, it does something. Well, I multiply. It, it does something exactly, exactly. So what we really, what really happened when we went from here to here, is that we did one more little sneaky step. We multiplied the top and bottom by absolute value of x cubed divided by absolute value of x cubed, and it was this absolute value that we snuck inside. Because that's okay, right? Absolute value times absolute value is the absolute value of the product. But on the outside is still uh, absolute value of x cubed divided by x cubed itself. Now, isn't that one? It's negative. It's negative when x is negative. The numerator is negative, but the uh, numerator is always positive, but the denominator is what's negative. Okay, so um, so then what happens to this at infinity? So then in the limit, that's kind of an ugly green, in the limit as x goes to infinity, this goes to zero, that goes to zero, that goes to zero, that goes to zero. And I think many of you will say it's negative seven twelfths, but it's actually positive seven twelfths. No. Now, let's think about this another way, okay? If that analysis was confusing to you, let's think about it another way, okay? How many are lost by that analysis? A, a good number. Let's think about it another way. Just look, so another approach, another approach, another approach, just look at the leading order of things. So most of you got seven twelfths, but some of you got negative seven twelfths, right? What's, this, what's the right sign when you have such a thing? What's the right sign? Just look at the leading terms at, at uh, negative seven X cubed divided by the absolute value of 12 X cubed, right? We all agree that that's really what's going on here. This is the limit as X goes to negative infinity. The denominator, Peter's got it. The denominator is always positive. The denominator, this is positive. What's happening to the numerator? It's negative seven X cubed, but X is negative infinity. Okay. So if you didn't like this, this special little trick here, forget about it. Just get your answer. And then if there was an absolute value inside, just say, wait a second, what's really going on here? Let's think for a second. This is gonna be negative huge. So a negative huge number times a negative one, this thing's also positive. Um, uh, if it was x squared, awesome, awesome question. So let me, let me finish this one. Uh, let me finish writing. And then uh, Shreya is going to give us another problem. So this is staying positive. When x is going to minus infinity, this thing is positive. 
So we have a positive divided by positive. Now let's go to Shreya's question. Okay, what if it was, what if instead of this, I had done, so another, uh, oh yeah, so, so the quizzes, uh, give your, uh, what do we say? If you, did, if you did something like this, give yourself a point. If you got negative 7 twelfths, uh, give yourself another point. If you got positive 7 twelfths, give yourself another point. Okay, so for getting some, there's like three points, one point for uh, figuring, whatever, this is made up, right? This is just for you to like think about your understanding. So one over X cubed is, if you thought to do that, that's good, that's the point. If you got some 7 twelfths, that's good. If you got the right sign, that's even better. Pass them all down to the end over here, please. Um, all right they've all made it across and down to will thanks well you can just leave them there when you when you got them on okay to, to shreya's question what would this be I changed the problem ever so slightly. Now there's an X to the fourth on top and an X to the fourth on bottom and a negative seven and a 12 and still the absolute value and a negative infinity. Tell me your name again. You're on. Say it again. Wouldn't that do nothing? I'm still dividing by X to the fourth. Exactly. But now that negative seven really would be a negative seven because x to the fourth, even if x is negative, x to the fourth, four is even. So x to the fourth would be positive. So negative seven x to the fourth would be negative. The numerator is negative, the denominator is positive. So this limit would be negative seven twelfths. Okay. A lot of you said this is easy and boring. I said it's going to get subtle. This is what I meant. Okay. So. Is there a, a rule for this? My rule for any math problem is think about what the hell's going on. Heck, it's going on, All right? Just think, just like look at what's, just make sure that you're using your intuition and always uh, not just plugging some, uh, some idea. All right, we got to divide by X cubed and, and here's the answer. But then do that, absolutely do that. When you get to the answer, say, does this answer make any sense? Fatima. Absolutely, excellent question. So let's do another example. Uh, well, same example. Let's see. Can I copy and paste? This would be even awesome. Copy. Yes. Paste. Oh my God. What happened? There we go. Love these toys. What happened to that five? There's the five. Okay. So Fatima's example. How about as x goes to positive infinity? Negative, yeah, Will. Oh, you had a question. Yeah, you guys are saying this is negative 7 twelfths because now this is positive. This is also positive at positive infinity. Now that negative 7 gives us some, a minus. Will. What would be wrong with just taking the leading term and putting them in the back of the head? Nothing would be wrong with taking the leading terms. That's exactly what this is. Just take the leading terms, forget everything that's, that's uh, in the book. That's not leading. This this one was leading. And and uh, just look at what's going on, and they're both positive when x is going to minus infinity. So in fact, this function, whatever it is, whatever its graph is, how many horizontal asymptotes does it have? Two. Let's write that down. So so f of x is equal to oh god, this thing three x squared minus seven x cubed plus five divided by the absolute value of 4x minus 3x squared plus 12x cubed has two 
horizontal asymptotes. One at one at y equals positive seven twelfths, and one at y equals negative seven twelfths. Okay, so these are the two horizontal asymptotes of this function. Should we see what this function looks like in real life? Yes. Any questions before I switch over to uh, Desmos, whatever it's called, Will? Uh, is, there, is there a scenario where ignoring everything else would, like, would be wrong? Um, it would not be wrong if the, as long as the limit is out to infinity. Right. So this is in the setting of horizontal asymptotes. If the x is going to infinity or negative infinity, then there's nothing wrong with it. Then the truth is it will be the leading term. The leading terms will tell you what's going on. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Uh, let's see what it looks like. Can someone read the function? Oh, I, yeah, no, that was a different function. What was it? Anybody? You, you, I, I, oh, I, you I, handed them in, of course. No, but you have them written down on your, come on, Sakar. Nobody's going to help me? 3x, thank you. 3x squared minus seven X cubed. How do I do cubed like this? I guess so. Plus something else, who cares? Divided by absolute value, right? Uh-oh. Uh, uh where is it? On the uh, absolute value, thank you. And what was it? Four X minus three X squared. And then what was the last thing? Plus 12x cubed? 12x cubed. Okay, I'm skipping you a couple of uh, things that don't matter all that much, but you can see here, so the function is doing something weird. I mean, this is what the function looks like. You want me to put in the, the other terms? Or you realize that those terms don't make any difference? Should I put them in? Yes, okay, fine, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you guys are right. Um, get in there, get in there, there we go. Plus what? Plus five, okay. Oh, that made, made things more interesting. What's the other one? Minus three X squared? Okay, so, all right, the function is doing whatever it's doing, but, we care about the behavior at infinity and negative infinity. And in either case, we should be getting, what, what were the limits? What's the limit at infinity? Seven twelfths. Can we do Y equals seven twelfths? Where's that line? Oh, look at that line. Seven twelfths is, uh, is this blue line. So that's our horizontal asymptote, right? It lines up with the red line almost immediately. And what's the other one? Y equals negative seven twelfths, negative seven twelfths. And negative seven twelfths, oh, Y equals, Y equals negative seven twelfths. And here's that green line, and that's the other, the other limit. Okay, you sir. There's a hole when the denominator is zero. If the denominator can vanish, then there's a vertical asymptote. And where is that? Uh, yeah, I guess it's at zero. Yeah, look at it. Uh, if X is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, but the numerator is not. The numerator is going to five as X goes to zero, whereas the denominator is going to zero. So we're dividing by zero. So we're gonna have a vertical asymptote at zero. Is that what you're pointing to? You said there'd be a hole Uh, at point eight or point nine, um, you mean here, where the asymptotes don't match? Yeah, we're putting up the blue and red matching. Where blue, like right here, this point? Yeah. That's just um, that's just an accident that they happen to intersect there. the The point of this asymptote is this blue is the asymptote at minus infinity. So we only care about the behavior of this function 
down here. And that's where red and blue are, are green. And the green is the limit as x goes to positive infinity. So that's this other horizontal appendage. It doesn't matter that they intersect. It doesn't matter that they disagree uh, over here. They're going to disagree, right? These are two different functions. One is y equals plus, plus 0.58. The other one is y equals minus 0.58. So there's the two lines uh, going off doing what they're doing. But, um, but that's the horizontal asymptote behavior. Does that make sense? Does that clarify what we, of course, you don't have the graphing calculator uh, on an exam. I want you to be able to figure out these things from first principles and not by drawing them and seeing what, what they do. Rohan. With fourth powers? Yep, let's, re let's replace the cubes with fourth powers. Before I erase it, any questions on the cubes? Okay, let's put the fourth, Yusuf, you were about to ask something? Let's put the fourth powers in. Fourth and fourth. Okay, so now they just both, the green line, the green line dominates both, the, describes, yeah, the green line describes the behavior both at positive infinity and at negative infinity. And the blue line is simply extraneous. Okay, so, be, so now we have a, an even exponent, leading exponent here. So it doesn't matter which way you're going positive or negative, it has the same sign. A line, a line. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, great, great question. So you're saying this limit would exist at infinity. We, I can't think of a scenario until you go to projective geometry where you would want to compare the limit at positive infinity to the limit at negative infinity. So those are just completely separate limits. It's not like the limit from the left and from the right. Uh, if you're asking a very deep question, actually. In projective geometry, the, the, these points meet back up, but never mind. Forget I said any of that. There's the positive infinity. There's a negative infinity. There's there's separate uh, things. Okay, so we so we won't compare. Uh, there's no such thing as the limit ad infinity. Again, you're asking a very deep question. Uh, there's no such thing as the limit ad infinity and negative infinity at the same time. They're just different places on the number. Even though secretly, okay, never mind. Other questions. Okay, let's do a couple more examples. Yeah. Couple more examples. Um, yeah, this is a good one. So here's an example. Uh, exa example. What is happening to the graph limit of sine of one over x as x goes to, let's say, positive infinity? Remember, sine of one over x was that crazy thing near zero, right? It's oscillating near zero, it has no limit. I'm not asking about zero, I'm asking about infinity. What happens to this thing at infinity? Other than Raga? Um, um, Caitlin. Why do you say that? Beautiful. Everybody catch that? Caitlin said, we already know that one over X is getting closer and closer to zero. Sine is a nice continuous function. So I'm getting sine of something very close to zero, but sine of zero is zero. So it's zero. That's what you're going to say right now. I know. Um, okay. Uh, anybody? Any question on that? Is that a, that's not a hand? No. Um, here's a harder one. Here's a harder one. So we know it goes to zero, but who goes to zero faster? Uh, limit as x goes to infinity of x times sine of one over x. I promised you it was going to get more subtle. X is going to infinity. Sine of one over X we just said is going to zero. Zero times infinity. Uh-oh. Zero times infinity is uh-oh. Indeterminate until further X. It's not indeterminate. It is an indeterminate form. You're absolutely right. Um, Doug, it, is that, you said that, right? Yeah, okay. Sometimes people say something I can't, okay. Uh, Doug said it's indeterminate. You're absolutely right. Indeterminate doesn't mean you stop and just say the limit doesn't exist. It might exist. Indeterminate means you just haven't determined it yet. It might not exist, but it might. 
So here's a sneaky thing you can do with limits. Raghav, are you about to tell us the sneaky thing we can do with limits? What is it? Yeah. Exactly. Outstanding. Beautiful. Beautiful. Here's what Raghav is telling us. We can think, we can make a new variable. This is called a change of variables. We can change variables, change our variable from X going to infinity to a new variable. Let's call it uh, U, T, let's call it T. T, which is one over X. One over X. What's happening to one over X as, what's happening to T as X goes to infinity? Zero. zero, right? X is going to infinity, so T is going to zero. And so we can change the limit. Instead of thinking about what happens to X times sine of one over X as X goes to infinity, let's just use a different dummy variable. Instead of X, we'll say T. T, as X goes to infinity, T goes to zero. So this is the limit as T goes to zero. What, what is X in terms of T? one over, so if T is one over X, T is one over X, then X is one over T. So I'll replace this X, I'll replace this X with a one over T. And then what happens to sine times sine of T? Somebody said, Dan, maybe. Okay, let's think about this. Well, all we're doing is we're changing our point of view. Instead of thinking about what happens as X goes to infinity, we introduced a new parameter, T, and we defined it to be one over X. As X goes to infinity, one over X goes to zero. So T goes to zero. And now we're gonna rewrite this limit in terms of T instead of X. So this is called the change of variables. We're changing who are, what, what the variable is. And this is the limit, instead of x going to infinity, it's the limit as t goes to zero. Instead of x, we have one over t, that's what x is. And instead of sine of one over x, we have sine of t. So now we need to know what happens to sine of t over t as t goes to zero. But we know that, that's one. Somebody said, Doug, somebody. You said it, what's your name? 25. Bye, bye. Jenny. Say it again. How do we know that these two things are the same? Oh, how do we know? Sine of x over x was the function that we were thinking about with the squeeze theorem. And we had this whole long proof that showed that at zero, that's an, uh, a removable singularity. There's a continuous extension of the function sine of x over x near zero, where the value is equal to one. Okay, so we already proved, uh, we already, we, already showed that um, sine of t over t or sine of x over x or sine of theta over theta, the limit as t goes to zero is equal to one. So this thing is, has a limit and that limit is so, so, so the limit as x goes to infinity of x times sine of one over X is one. Okay, does that make sense? Um, let's do a couple more before time runs out. So again, as Doug said, it is indeterminate. Infinity times zero is indeterminate. That doesn't mean uh, it, the, the limit doesn't exist. The limit can exist and is equal to. You wanna see a graph of this function, X times sine of one over X? Doug. Well, how do we know like we get to an indeterminate form like like when to stop or when to rearrange the variables. Well, if um, so, so now you, just that you, do it you should have enough experience with doing problems of this nature so that you start seeing what the patterns are. That's a great question. Doug's question is, how would you know to do that? Well, you had never seen a problem before, at least not in my class. Some of you have. Uh, where you change the variables. But now I showed you this technique of changing the variables. We did this together. Next time you see something that looks indeterminate, you might say, wait a second, I think I might be able to change a variable. In fact, we're gonna do another example like that 
right now. I just want to say one thing and then Ali, uh, just a second, Ali. Uh, forgot what the, oh, and then sine T over T, this one we just, we, we, we have to know, we, we work it out already several times. Did that answer your question, Doug? Ali. So you recognize that you have to change the variable and swap them out, but you also know it's contingent from like the limit of like of x to infinity. Yeah, because if I wrote here limit as x goes to infinity of one over t, wait a second, t, x is moving, but I'm I want to know the value of t. So I want to change everything into t. So like you know how to like you know you can change it to like t something like zero. Well, because because the relationship between t and x is we, we made this, this is our choice. Our choice was how to reparametrize the problem, how to have a new parameter instead of X being the parameter that's governing things, we have a new parameter T. So this choice we made, this choice was forced on us yeah. by the fact that X is going to infinity, one over X is going to zero. So T is going to zero. That's how I got this T going to zero. Yeah. So like by changing the variables, you knew how to change the limits. Yeah, let's do one more right now before we run out of time. So let's do another example. The limit as X goes to minus infinity of E to the one over X. Oh my God. That's a weird looking thing. E to the one over X. What's the graph of E to the X? This kind of thing. Okay. So E to the X, let's recall, Y equals E to the X looks like this. So what's happening to e to the one over x as x goes to minus infinity? Shreya? Uh, that's a good guess. Why do you say one? Exactly. OK, that's great. So Shreya says one over x is going to 0 as x goes to negative infinity. If I take one over a giant negative number, I'm getting closer and closer to 0. So e is going to e to the zero is is one. Okay, good. That was another thing. Maddie told me uh, you guys could use a refresher on some log facts. I forgot to mention at the beginning. Oh, and the solutions to the uh, the quizzes and the uh, assignments, the workshop assignments, should be getting posted into Canvas soon. So look look for those. Um, right. Last example, and then I gotta let you go. Last example. How about the limit as X goes to zero from below of one over X? So here's a more complicated one. So for this example, we could just plug in because we know what happens to one over X, Treya told us. What happens here? Well, there's a variety of ways of doing this one. One is to just think about what happens when X is a tiny, tiny negative number, Yusuf. Oh, what happens when X is a tiny, tiny negative number this is going to be a, a negative, a massive negative number. And e to the minus infinity is zero. OK, so already we, we should think that the limit should be zero. But another way to do this same problem is to replace, as before, uh, let t equal 1 over x. So what happens to, I mean, we sort of skip this step just using our intuition, but we can do this step not just using our intuition, as x goes to zero from below, t goes to, t is one over x, negative infinity, because x is, is a tiny negative number. So one over x is a giant negative number. And then this will be equal to the limit as x goes to, uh, not as x now, as t goes to, negative infinity of e to the t. Okay, and so now, now we look at e to the t as t goes to negative infinity, that's all the way down here again. So it's another way of seeing the same thing that that limit is doing. All right.